how many of you um, are currently actively engaged in some way on Campus Live? Either you're teaching or you're on a board or you are, so it's, we have a lot between kids and professors and uh, of direct exposure, which, so I'm very eager for this to be a conversation. I'm, I am fascinated by um, what both John and Frank have written on this subject over the years and really eager to interrogate them, but then I, I want this to be a conversation um, amongst all of us. Um, uh, Frank Rooney, as you know, is uh, an op-ed columnist at the New York Times where he has, he has held one of my favorite arrays of jobs from you know, Rome bureau chief and restaurant critic and covering the Bush White House. It's just a fantastic set of, of assignments. Um, and probably most relevant to this conversation, uh, you were the author of a book that I as a parent found enormously therapeutic, which is uh, Where You Go Is Not Who You Are. Uh, an antidote to the college admissions mania. Um, so that's a very relevant piece of this. And John McWhorter is an associate professor of English and comparative literature at Columbia, and I'm very proud to say also a, a columnist for Time and for CNN and for Slate, and a podcaster at Slate, the Lexington Valley uh, podcast. And and I'm going to stipulate up front in the interest of full disclosure that this is not really going to be a debate uh, in the sense that we don't have, this is this topic about speech on campus, which we have seen play out uh, in a particularly vivid form, I think, in, in this last year, and I'm gonna, I want to hear from you about why that is, but in some ways is as old as can be about the debates over what a college, what's the purpose of a college? Is it a laboratory where students get to test ideas and ideals? Is it a place where, um, where they are prepared for the world beyond or protected from it? Uh, I think it's, we're at this moment where the very notion of what is the purpose of a university education and what that atmosphere and climate should be uh, is under review and arguably under assault. And so that is so important, not only to those of us, as I do, who have kids in college, but those of us who are employing the kids who are coming out of college, and, and all of us as citizens of what kind of a, of a broader national conversation are we going to be having, are we going to have permission? So we are going to start on campus, but I also want us to move beyond the campus. But just to lay the groundwork, can each of you give me your sense of how it is we got here, got to this place where, where speech itself becomes a form of violence and violence is used to prevent and shut down speech? How did, what happened that we got here? John, why don't you take a crack at that? Um, I think that the spark for the current situation is perhaps more mundane than we'd like to think. I don't think that it's that for some reason, everybody went crazy. I don't think that it's because of the president that we happen to have in office. I think that it's social media. Social media, especially when you have it in your pocket, especially in the form of the iPhone, allows bubbles of consensus to come together in such a way that you can whip people up in a way that was not possible a generation before or even 10 years before. Also, it's a medium that's not only about words, but pictures and moving pictures. And that is more viscerally stirring than the pamphlets and that thing called the physical newspaper from the past. And so I think it's inevitable that with the rise of social media, you would have this assault on free speech on campuses in the same way as I don't think there would have been a tea party if it weren't for Twitter and Facebook taking off in 2009. I don't think that it was Obama as the key factor. It was the fact that that kind of sentiment could be whipped up to such an extent by these toys that it's easy to forget now what it was like when they didn't exist. So that's what I think the beginning of this was. And it's why it scares me, because social media obviously is not going away. Frank? I agree, I agree entirely with that. I, I want to say one thing, though, if we can just back up for a second, because I think before we kind of light into what's going on and talk about it, it's important to remember 
we are talking about a minority of students on campus. Um, and we're talking about a minority of events that actually turn violent. I mean, there's been plenty of protest of, speak, of speech and that sort of thing. Um, there have been enough of these incidents that I think this is very fair game, but we still, we're not talking about all students or even most students. Um, so can you review some of the, some of the institute, some of the episodes that just lead us to be even, here we are in Aspen, where this is a topic of conversation? What is it that tipped I mean, it? some of the recent ones that I think are on people's mind, uh, there was the Middlebury incident where Charles Murray was invited there to speak. Um, Middlebury did practically everything right. I mean, they had a liberal professor who was going to question him. So they were not bringing him to campus in a way that made it seem like they were endorsing any of his ideas. Um, and he didn't even get a chance to speak. You know, students uh, went into the lecture hall, they got up, and rather than, say, turning their back to him just as a kind of uh, visual gesture of protest, they shouted him down. Um, and sort of publicly shamed him in one of these sorts of um, shaming rituals that you're seeing over and over again where someone is not just wrong, um, they are to be pilloried, you know, in public. And that got so out of hand that Charles Murray ended up being hustled to a private area um, to do the interview, like, on camera. And in all of these movements back and forth, it got so violent that the professor, Allison Stanger, actually ended up injured in the hospital. And um, that's, that's one that caught a lot of people's attention. More recently, Evergreen College. Um, had a very fascinating story take place where uh, they do a day of absence every year um, where uh, black students would leave campus to have discussions about racial matters, um, racial issues, racial sensitivity. They suggested this year that maybe white students should leave instead, and a biology professor named Brett Weinstein wrote something, wrote an email to the organizers that went public that said, that feels to me like forced segregation. That's the opposite of what we should be doing. He ended up in the crosshairs of, of um, of student anger and being labeled a racist. And he was actually told by college, uh, college police not to come on campus a co for a couple days because they didn't think they could keep him safe. Those are the two, I think, most lurid recent inc incidents. Are, are there ones you'd add to that? Or? Those are the two that probably should be kept in mind in terms of the physicality of it. And also something else to mention is that in both of these cases, by no means were all of the protesters black or Latino. Oh, no, no, yeah. And so white students are gathering in this in equal numbers. Absolutely, yeah. So I take your point that these are isolated incidents. But in, so in a way, maybe the more important and, and consequential thing that is happening is, is much more routine. My, my daughter in college talks about professors who, who start every class with an apology of if their pronoun use offends someone. She says it's like there's a thought bubble over their head that's please don't fire me. That you know, She talks about a climate in which professors seem to be frightened of their students and in a sense students of each other about a fear of giving offense. That, that as anodyne a statement as you know, um, America is the land of opportunity is counted as a microaggression. Or America is a melting pot or yeah. And you know, John, you're you're a specialist in linguistics. A lot of this has to do with language, and you know, the the, the law school that debates whether using the word violate, like such and such violates the law, mm -hmm. is a is a trigger. You know, and this is this is not a protest that turns violent. This is everyday classroom interaction. Can you can you talk about how you've how that manifests itself in the yeah. routine workings of a campus? There is a performative recruitment of metaphor going on here. And so the idea is to say, we need a safe space from this kind of abuse. Now that starts out as meaning we might go somewhere where we can feel more comfortable with one another. Then the new idea becomes that we physicalize this notion of safe space and start asking white people to leave. Or that, for example, at, um, was it Oberlin? where the request was that black students have various safe spaces designated all over campus where they could be safe from the incessant racism being aimed at them by whites. I think anybody in their more sober moments understands that even though racism exists, microaggressions are real, that college campuses are perhaps the least racist spots on earth. And the idea that any student is undergoing a constant litany of racist abuse is theater. It's theatrical. It's not true. You hate to say that to somebody 19 years old, but it's not true. However, to say, well, we need a safe space and then to physicalize it such that you're actually expecting people to allow you to have a place where you can be, where you can be shielded from all of this abuse that you're claiming is happening, 
is a kind of performance that I think students are doing and being supported in because we live in a society in which, and this is a good thing, we live in a society in which, in contrast to the way it was two generations ago, it's considered extremely incorrect and even immoral to be a racist or a sexist among a certain educated segment of the public, which is not tiny, even though that's not all of America. It's at the point where, for example, to be a racist is almost equivalent to being a pedophile. That's good in many ways. But this new movement takes the idea that you're supposed to show that you're not a racist or even that you're supposed to be sniffing out evidence of racism everywhere to give yourself a sense of legitimacy in society into a place where language is being abused because the actual safe space is something that isn't necessary and ends up abusing, you could argue, the people who are not black or Latino. And then when it gets to the point that a speaker comes to campus and the idea is not that you protest the speaker, which is what we did when I was in college in the 80s, but that the speaker is not allowed to pollute the space with their words. Again, that's interesting, but it's theater. One thinks almost of Brecht when people are doing things like this. This is not the way usual sociopolitics happens. And it needs to be called out, I think. And that's tough because we're talking about behavior of people who are under 22 but it serves no purpose, as I think we've been able to see. So in this, in this framework, uh, speech itself is a form of violence. Mm -hmm. It how can did, be interpreted that way. So how did that happen, that, that, that saying something offensive and throwing a punch become equated? Well, it starts again with sense. I mean, I think the idea that words are not always mere words really comes to the fore in the 80s with a lot of radical feminist arguments from people like Catherine McKinnon and Andrea Dworkin. And there was value in the argument that we need to check the sorts of things that we can say to each other. And that might go beyond just a certain short checklist of epithets. But then you can take it too far to the point where words are violent simply because you don't agree with them or find them slightly noxious. That's where free speech ends up being choked. So there's, there's something other there's another interesting thing at play on these campuses that I'm curious if you agree, I think, factors into this, which is we're living vis-a-vis -vis when we went to college, we're living in an era where the relationship between student and college is entirely different. And what students have come to expect from colleges is entirely different. They are much more customers, and the colleges are service providers. Um, and so they come to college with an expectation of a pleasant time, of a universe that they can tailor and bend to their liking. Um, and this demand for safe space is this demand not to be subjected to speakers who are going to cause you emotional turmoil. It's all part of that. It was really interesting. I don't know if you remember back, <clears throat> excuse me, when the students were protesting at the University of Missouri about the president, and he was ultimately ejected. I remember going back and looking at, at, a, at a formal list they did of their complaints and demands, and one of their complaints was that after Ferguson happened, the school hadn't convened enough sessions for faculty and administrators to talk to students and make sure they were okay with all of this. And I read that and I thought, well, that's a lovely thought, but I would never have expected that from my college back in the mid 80s. It was a much different era. And I think that changed relationship between student and school is a big part of, what, of, of how students are behaving and what they feel is a reasonable complaint and a reasonable demand. Would so, you? So students are customers, but their parents are customers too, yeah. who are writing spectacularly large checks to these universities that are harrowing. You say that like someone who knows. <laughs> All too well. So one thing I'm curious about is, is I am sure many of us remember that the most formative experiences in college were the, were the bare knuckled arguments we had, which often for the first time with people who had different backgrounds, different experiences, different you know, political and ideological uh, positions. And for the first time, you're thinking your logic was tested. You realized what of your beliefs you held on the basis just of unthinking prejudice versus the ones that you could defend. If you're, if you're a parent and this is the experience you want your child to have in shaping their, their intellect and their instincts, and, and, and they are not having it, where is the where is the push, where are the adults in this conversation? Either the parents who are paying the bills or the alumni or for that matter the faculty who are, are the ones in some cases being driven out like Professor Weinstein. Why are they not a counterforce 
to these, these trends that you're talking about? Well, I think luckily, in some ways, the problem is less large than we might think. And that, as Frank said, we're talking about a minority of students. What I've seen as a professor myself in classes, it went up very sharply after about 2013, is that it's a certain kind of student and you only need about two of them in a class. And that will scare everybody else except maybe one person who's invariably male, I'm not sure why, who is really up for a fight. But that's not most students. And so it ends up taming discussion in a way that has really dismayed me. But So all students are affected, even if only a small minority are. Affected. But the point is that most parents would not want things to be this way, especially because most students wouldn't want things to be this way. I have lost count of how many students I've had in the past about three semesters, including many who were sobbing that Hillary Clinton did not become president. These are people on the left who are upset that they can't speak out in class or in the dormitory. I had two students who didn't write senior theses on really rather anodyne topics because they were afraid that in thesis seminar in American studies, they would get their heads ripped off for some of the conclusions they were coming to about things that nobody would have batted an eye at 10 years ago. It really is, is that bad. Parents should speak out more because unfortunately administrators aren't doing it. The administrators basically want to just keep everything quiet to keep the funds coming in. Parents in this day and age, because college has become more vocational and because the economy feels more uncertain, the future feels more uncertain, they want to know one thing for the, from the college. They want to know, are you going to have, are you going to prepare my kid, put my kid on a trajectory where he or she has a job coming out? And they're Isn't not, this exactly the, the thing, well, therefore, they should be worried yeah, about? Yeah, but they're not looking at these sort of larger intellectual matters, and schools are failing students. I went and spoke at a, at a liberal arts college in the Northeast that I think was not unusual, but quite usual, and I remember at a dinner afterward at the president's house, you know, where they were sort of filling me on the school, we were at a table, various faculty members, administrators were going around the table talking about um, particular points of pride about the school. And I heard over and over again different aspects of diversity. You know, we are the most welcoming to trans students. We are the most welcoming to international students. We are the most welcoming to African American. On and on, and this was a continued theme. We got to the end of the table, and they said, do you have any questions? And they told me about all of the different affinity groups um, and, and, and those sorts of things they had. And I said, is there a Republican group on campus? Is there a student Republican? And they all looked, they were shocked at the question, and the answer was no. But they were surprised to get the question, because that's how intellectually homogenous so many campuses have become. So you have written that this is about emotional coddling, intellectual impoverishment, and that students have been done a terrible disservice. So assuming that the adults in the room, whether parents or teachers or administrators, are, are not looking to ill-serve these students, what what is the damage being done? What is the, the argument that this is rather far from protecting them, that this is something that is damaging to them? I um, grew up as a, as a fact brat of sorts, and I remember asking my mother when I was around nine what the point of college was. Even at that age, I thought some people leave after high school, then some people go to this thing called college, and even then, it looked kind of freewheeling from what I could see. And I asked her once, what is the point of that extra four years? And she said that the difference is not necessarily that people who've graduated from college know more facts, but they have learned that life is complex and that any issue that is worth talking about is one where easy conclusions are gonna be elusive, that the answer is not just gonna to be to snap your fingers and say, well, that's been figured out, that you acquire a sense of horizons. And I've learned that that is dead on. What college is about is partly career preparation, although that's a whole conversation, partly that you learn who the 15th president was or something like that, James Buchanan. But then <laughs> it's supposed to be that you learn that there are many different ways of looking at life and the world, and that the ones that you've been trained to think are evil might not be. And so, for example, when I was in college in the 80s, Republicans were thought of as ridiculous. Most certainly, I remember living on a hall at one point, and there were Republicans down at the end, and you were supposed to think of them as some sort of vermin. Nobody questioned this. This is during the, the Reagan era. And I couldn't help noticing that they were also some of the nicest people on the hallway. And over the years, I learned I'm not a Republican, but I can see how you can be one and have a coherent worldview. And it happened from listening to them and eating lunch with them, et cetera, and now they're in my swimming pools, et cetera. That is an experience <laughs> that I don't think 
that students are having as much these days. And that means that the education is failing them. They're thinking that life is much simpler than it is. They're not learning how to think. I think what you said about, um, I think they're not learning how morally complicated the world can be. Exactly. You know? and, um, it was fascinating to me after Trump won the election, um, and maybe this was selective media reporting, but we read so much about schools at which ca classes were canceled because students were so upset, schools that set up sort of essentially group therapy sessions for students to be consoled. I didn't read about a single school that convened groups to talk about why it happened and who the people who voted for Trump were and why they maybe were so attracted to him. That latter thing would have been true education. The former thing is just hand-holding they're being given the impression they can go out into the world. And when their feelings are hurt, there's gonna be someone to say, you're right, that was terrible, let me console you. That's not the way the adult world works, and, and I think we're producing very, very fragile graduates. I, I remember um, something was said to me once by someone at Pomona about the students he was encountering. I was asking him if they were unbelievable rock stars in this era of declining acceptance rates. And he said, well, you know, some of them are. He said, but here's what really strikes me. These, these students are stunningly fragile. They've lived these lives in bubble wrap. Um, they see the world in very simple ways. And he worried about what would happen to them when they went out beyond Pomona. Is there, because you've written a lot about the, the insane competitiveness of, of college admissions, at least for a certain quadrant of kids. Is there a connection between what has happened in the college admissions space with this? Yes. And on what's the? Yes, S schools are being judged by their admission rates. So they're trying to get them lower. So they are trying to build up the gleaming facilities. They are totally focused on the customer experience so they'll get more applicants, so their acceptance rates will plunge, and so that they will rise in the marketplace. And if you want more and more students applying to your school so that you can have the cachet of that really low acceptance rate, you need to create an experience for them that is not provocative, but that is enjoyable. Um, the most weaponized word of the moment is privilege. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about privilege and how it has come to be seen and deployed the, the whole white privilege paradigm is very interesting because I think that it should be part of an education for students to learn that there is something that we now, now title it white privilege, that's fine, and that these are things that must be considered such that a student wouldn't look at, say, a disadvantaged part of the city and just say, well, what's wrong with them? The idea is to understand that a lot of what the person sees is because people start out at different places and that whiteness is a privilege. However, once again, our problem these days is that it's being taken into a direction that's less constructive. The idea is not that people can learn that there is white privilege and be considered to have learned it and then learn some other things. The idea is that you are to learn that you are a privileged white person, you are to learn it over and over, and that really what you're supposed to learn is to feel guilty about it and to express that on a regular basis, understanding that at no point in your entire lifetime will you ever be a morally legitimate person because you have this privilege. In other words, it becomes a kind of Christian teaching, and it seems to only serve a certain purpose, and I hate to say this, and I don't mean to hurt anybody's feelings. For white people, it is a great way to show that you understand that racism is real. For black people and Latino people, it is a great way to assuage how bad a self-image a race can have after hundreds of years of torture. I can't speak for Latinos there, but certainly for black Americans. It ends up being a kind of a security blanket. I don't think that either one of those things takes students anywhere. To be a black student who learns that their purpose, that something that's special about them is that they can make a loud noise and make white people guilty, I don't think that's an education. And quite honestly, I think that if a white person feels that constantly attesting to their privilege, and constantly attesting that they still have things to learn without specifying exactly what more it is that they have to learn, is somehow constructive, I suggest that that be re-examined. White privilege is something that you can learn and know, and that's it. Now, I'm not a utopianist. I feel that life only gets so good in complex societies of human beings. I think that a lot of what we're talking about is a political vision which is highly idealist. 
There is an argument for it. I have heard it very articulately defended, but it's hardly the only way to look at how a society can be. We're losing that kind of flexibility in the way we talk about these things on college campuses. I have to share an email I got because, to your point, uh, after I wrote about Evergreen, um, I got some emails from people involved with the school, connected with the school, and this one gentleman who I think, um, a white, white gentleman, because um, his picture was visible in like, you know, his return email or whatever, um, I think he said he had a daughter at the school, and he was chastising me for writing with any sympathy about this professor and what had happened, and said I was focusing on the wrong thing, I should focus on what a miserable experience mar minority students have at Evergreen. To your point before, I kind of doubt it's that miserable in the context of the world, Evergreen's a very progressive place. But he said, you know, you're focusing on whatever injury you think was done to Professor Weinstein. And no, I was focusing on the injury to the college climate. And he said, that's a silly thing to write about. Professor Weinstein is white. He'll be just fine. And I thought as a final word, that just shuts the debate right there. But it's exactly what you're talking about. Professor Weinstein is white. He enjoys white privilege. You know, there's no reason to worry about anything that happens to him. And he sort of isn't an equivalent moral actor in all this. He doesn't have the same weight because he belongs to the oppressor class. So how much blowback you as a columnist at the failing New York Times? Um, thank you. Thank, thank you for getting our name right. I appreciate that. Uh, and, you know, you as a professor on an Ivy League campus, with each of you taking positions that are not in the mainstream of these phenomena, how much pushback do you, do you get from your readers, from your students, from the, the when you're on campus? Frank, your stories on this are probably better than mine. I'm a really delicate soul, so I sort of, I don't, I don't look at my Twitter notifications. I don't, I, you know, I, I read the first line of an email and trash it quickly if I think it's going to be psychically disturbing. Um, <laughs> but, no, I mean, you kind of got to, you got to know. you're a snowflake. You got to, yeah, I'm, I'm a snowflake, yeah. Um, but I, I'll tell you, I mean, just as a, uh, along these lines, I wrote what I thought was a not particularly provocative column maybe nine months ago about, I, I, I gave it a provocative headline, which I think was something like the lie about college diversity. And what I was talking about, and it's part of this phenomenon we're talking about now, was how um, colleges you know, made a lot of noise and made a lot of sort of at least cosmetic effort um, to assemble these diverse student bodies. But then once people got to campus, made almost no effort to make sure people, diverse groups of people were acting in diverse ways. So you, know, you could go into X affinity group, you could live in a very kind of carefully chosen environment, and on this diverse campus, you could hang with a very particular tribe and no one else. Um, and in the course of that, I questioned uh, the wisdom of affinity groups. And I, several emails did make their way to me where um, people on Twitter were saying, I have no idea Frank Bruni was such a racist. Which is part of this is the, is the term racist is thrown around. Um, with alarming alacrity right now. And I mean, in, in, in going over some of the incidents that bring us to this panel today, I was looking back to what happened at Claremont McKenna College recently to Heather McDonald, who wrote a book questioning whether the Ferguson effect you know, was um, you know, questioning, make, asking pointed questions about Black Lives Matter. But then again, Donna Brazil has asked pointed questions about Black Lives Matter. She was labeled in student discussions at Claremont as, as a white supremacist fascist. That's a long way to go <laughs> from what she, from the question she raised. She's a conservative, but, but in a lot of circles these days, that equals white supremacist fascist. I would say that um, I do read my Twitter <laughs> notifications, and um, I find that as my little theme today has been that this is a fringe minority view. However, it's this spinning buzzsaw blade that ordinary people want to avoid, and so it silences people. But I hear from the occasional person who doesn't like my views about things like this. They're students who don't like my views about things like this. Most people are not natively confrontational. I don't have anybody coming and yelling at me in my office. They just would never take my courses. But when I do hear from somebody who doesn't approve of my views on things like this, what I am called is a white supremacist. I am a white supremacist in line with people like Bill Bowe and Bo Connor. Yeah, that's, that's me. And of course, that is an utterly athletic, recreational use of the term. You could go through <laughs> everything that I've written over 20 years, and you would find nothing that advocated anything that somebody 20 years ago would have recognized as white supremacists. The word is being used as a battering ram. And battering rams are big and crude. Think of something like on the Flintstones. And we're being taught that that is higher wisdom. 
it simply isn't. And so this needs to be called out. I don't care who calls me names, but to the extent that on college campuses, students are becoming these unquestioning people who think that issues are much easier than they are. Something needs to be said more loudly than just people like Frank and I writing editorials. But college administrators and many college professors are quite craven about this sort of thing. Wasn't tenure supposed to protect them from being scared of their students? <laughs> Well, it doesn't because if, even if you have tenure, to have students in your class hating you can be tough. I've had a tiny little dose of it and you really do have to pull your stomach in. But here's a quick illustrative anecdote of how it actually could be. Trump day, actually Trump week after he was elected, was alarming on university campuses. It was the worst week at Columbia I've ever had. Every second student was in tears for days. And I wasn't prepared to say that you're all crybabies. There were a lot of people with very legitimate concerns, many Latino students who were worried about immigration issues. It was, a, it was a nasty time. And I walked into my introduction to linguistics class, 150 students, and you know, so many people were crying. So many people had their heads down on their desks that one of my TAs came up and said, Professor McWhorter, I don't think you're gonna be able to teach today. It's been requested that you conduct a session where you talk to the students about what's going on. And that was true. There was no way I was gonna talk about out intransitive verbs that day. <laughs> but I did get up and I told them, you know what? You may have been told by a lot of your other professors that what you need to take from what happened this week is that the country is full of racists and that you should hate all of the people, quote unquote, out there. And I said, I'm not going to give you that. I said, I've known many of the sorts of people who voted for Trump and they were not racists in any sense of the word that makes any sense among people who are using language properly. I said, what we're going to use this session for is we're going to talk about why these people voted that way. And we're not going to call them racist. We're going to try to figure out what led them to vote for somebody like this and how we could avoid it happening again. The students liked that. I was not revolted against for doing that. If there were one or two who thought that I was no good for not calling out white privilege and that therefore that made me a white supremacist that day, they didn't say anything to me and, and life went on. The, now, I'm not trying to make myself a hero. I'm sure there were other professors who did that. But that needs to be the model. I think it would be more OK than many of our college presidents seem to think. For How many other professors, though? Yeah. How many other professors at other schools do you think did what you did, though? I don't know. What's your, what's your guess? What's your guess? Few. I wasn't trying to make myself sound like a hero, but I'll bet it was an infinitesimal number. Right. But I think that they needn't worry, because life isn't quite as hard as they seem to think. Frank, do you think this debate is damaging to liberalism? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because it, it turns liberalism into illiberalism. People see it that way. I mean, there are still, I mean, we, we, we pretend they don't exist. There are still kind of people in the center, for lack of a better word. And they watch the way various polls, various sides comport themselves, and I think they draw conclusions from it. Um, and I don't think liberals look liberal, liberal at all in this way. They look utterly illiberal. I also think all of those of us who are adults bear, something to, bear, bear some blame here, and we need to think about it. The message I assume students in college, and I'd be curious for your take on this, the message I think they get from the bitter, bitter tribalism of our politics and, and from the way various partisans talk to and about each other is that it is okay to be strident. Um, it's virtuous to be uh, that passionate, even if it's passionate in a destructive way. I mean, we're giving them a lot of signals um, that virtue resides in being unyielding. Um, and so I think we bear some responsibility and need to think about what we've done in adult political society um, to actually encourage them to behave the way they do. Well, I'm, I'm glad you raised that because I, I am interested in teasing out the connection between a polarized, I mean, the country has been divided around issues forever. It, it's the nature of a democracy, it should be. But there is a difference between, you know, I disagree with you, I think you're wrong. And I think and you're evil. You're a bad person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so what is the connection between this climate of, of demonization broadly and what we're talking about? Well, Nancy, I might, I might be wrong about this, but the idea that not only do I disagree with you, but you're a bad person, that specifically might not be what's new because that was how people were having conversations on the Upper West Side in living rooms during Nixon, for example. It wasn't only I disagree with you about Nixon, it was you're a bad person, and Archie Bunker yeah, and Maud. That's the Upper West. I live on the Upper West Side. That's, you know, we're, we're, we're not <laughs> a focus there. group. We're not a focus group, yeah. Right. I, I, th 
I think that more specifically the problem is you're a bad person and you should not speak at all. That's the new thing, the idea being you can't express your view at all. Or something I've seen is somebody says something Republican in that living room, and a certain kind of person, a grown-up, says, I can't listen to this, and walks off into the study. I can't hear it. Well, why? What's, what's going to happen to you? Whereas that person's mother would have just battled, battled it out over her what, cold duck or whatever they were drinking in that living room at the time. <laughs> Today, the idea is that you, my parents drank that. Today, the idea is that you, you walk out of the room. You can't hear it because the space isn't safe. That's a theatrical gesture. It should be used for auditions. That's what the problem is, I think, today. So we just, I think we do, we do attribute more evil to the other side than we did in the past. I mean, so? if you can believe, you know, I mean, it's hard to know whether people's answers in public opinion surveys, whether they kind of know themselves well, but I mean, there have been some that have shown that 50 years ago, if you asked people, if you asked Democrats, if you asked Republicans, would it bother you if your child married outside the party, you know, like the faith? <laughs> um, the people who said yes, it was like below 10% in each case. It's now up to something like 40 to 50% in each case. That's true. Um, and that's a question, the same question 50 years ago now. So that suggests, as does some other research, that's, that was not done by the Pew Center, but the Pew Center's done some other research that suggests that people do see those in the other party not just as wrongheaded, but as evil in a way that they didn't 50 years ago. So in our profession, we just saw this play out in, a, in another interesting, it feels like an iteration of the same conversation around the controversy around Megyn Kelly interviewing Alex Jones. And, and the, for those of you, if you didn't follow this, uh, Alex Jones, as a proponent of a number of conspiracy theories, but the one that was most relevant here, partly because the interview was going to air on Father's Day, was uh, saying that the, the Sandy Hook massacre never happened. And for the, for the Newtown parents who made the case that to give him a platform, someone who has, who has uh, promoted such a pernicious theory, was so acutely painful to them that he should not be given this, this even, even if it is to criticize him, to challenge him, that it is just too big a source of pain to give him this platform. It feels to me like there are a lot of plumb lines between that argument and the one that we're having on campuses. How did you, how did you see that playing out? Well, I mean, that, that one I think is all about the way it's executed. First of all, Alex Jones, the idea that she was giving him a platform and exposing ideas that were hidden until that point to the world is ludicrous because Alex Jones was plenty out there and most people knew about it. Um, and then it boils down to, okay, bring him in, but how do you, how do you then comport yourself? How do you grill him? How do you deal with him? And I think we'll never see the whole footage of how that went down because as that got rolled out and caused such a ruckus, I think a lot of work was done in the editing room to make sure that seemed like the toughest interrogation possible. In the end, that worked out well, I think, because he was not allowed to just sit there you know, and spread crazy crackpot theories. He was held accountable for them. Um, and, and I, but I think, so I think it's important. I think in the end, that worked out well. Um, but it would have been different if she had been having someone in for an interview whose ideas weren't already out there as much as his were. That's how I feel about it. There's a little bit of the safe space ideology there, too, though. And I would, um, I'm exempting the parents who had to go through that horror. I often thought about how they must feel. I can't speak for them, but a great many people beyond them thought that Alex Jones shouldn't be on TV for 20 minutes one time. And it seemed to me that the important thing was that it was just one interview. Just one thing. It wasn't going to change his fortunes any because he's already got a fortune. And you can just imagine if, say, 15 years ago, some people who didn't like what gangster rappers said decided that somebody like Tupac shouldn't have been interviewed on TV even once. Somehow when the sympathies are different, everybody understands it was just one interview. The idea was more of this idea that he shouldn't be given a platform. That sounds good because platform is kind of a long word. But what that really means is he shouldn't be seen. He shouldn't be in my space. Some of it was also because of Megyn Kelly's history on Fox News. I think that if it had been Judy Woodruff or somebody like that, people would have felt differently. But really, the proof is in the pudding. Yes, I think the interview was changed somewhat because of the outcry, but Alex Jones is a real piece of work, <laughs> some other words I'd like to use. And frankly, the interview makes him look like a complete imbecile. It's effective. It really has done what everybody would like. Again, I can't speak for how the parents at Sandy Hook. But hasn't, the, I mean, to now go back to campuses, hasn't the argument about needing to surface ideas and, and 
and ideologies and philosophies that are that are are controversial, that are offensive, is exactly to to acquaint students with them and give them the tools to poke holes. To argue back, yeah. To argue give them the back. tools to argue back. Absolutely. Um, and if you're not if you're not exposing them to that, um, you're not giving them those tools. You know, you're not you're not you're not teaching them how to debate and how to how to better understand why they have the feelings they do, and in some instances, not with Alex Jones, Jones to maybe discover that something they believe to be unalterably true isn't. You know, um, I wonder how are they ever going to become people whose ideas um, and whose epiphanies change at all over time? You know, if they are encouraged to marinate in the beliefs they have at the age of 19. I remember when I was in college, there was this um, pastor, Pastor Jed Smock who used to come to campus every autumn and preach. He was against, he didn't like gay people. I don't remember him saying anything about black people, but maybe I just didn't stand there long enough. Just hated everything. His wife looked like something out of a daguerreotype standing always behind him and never saying anything. Just an utterly disgusting man. And it was a sport that any sensible person would surround him and yell at him all day. So you would stand and you'd listen to this person spouting all this nonsense, and then you'd hear all the counter arguments. I learned all sorts of things. Nobody chased Jed off of the campus, and he's still, he's still around today and doing the same thing to ever decreasing effect. But today, he would be physically chased off of the campus and smacked on the behind. I don't see that as an improvement. You, all, you also, these students aren't making these ideas and these speakers go away in any real sense. They're just, they're just protecting themselves and purging their environment. But it doesn't. Right. It well, does, Berkeley blocks Ann Coulter. It's not as though. Yeah, but it doesn't make that viewpoint, that ideology, that tribe go away. In fact, it's more likely you know, to encourage it. So this is my last question, and then I want to throw open to the room, so prepare your questions. But I had reporters covering this campaign who, who, who came away from their travels and their interviews, particularly with Trump voters and at his rallies, thinking that, OK, economic issues and issues of globalism were important, but the cultural issues, and not the traditional cultural issues of social conservative issues, but cultural issues specifically about political correctness and what is and is not permissible to say and think, were the critical factor in driving a lot of people in their vote. Do you think that that is the case? Um, I, I don't know if they were the critical. I don't know if we'll ever be able to apportion this stuff. It was definitely a factor. Um, I think if you, if you talk to people like that, I saw it in my own family. A lot of people felt that their, their language was being policed. They weren't even able to kind of work through their feelings publicly and verbally about things because if they tripped across the wrong word, they would be shamed. And I kept thinking during that, like, you know, we now throw around not just the word racist, but the word homophobe, you know, very, very liberally. When you're throwing that around to a 65-year-old Southern Baptist woman in Mississippi, let us not forget that just a few years ago, Barack Obama was not formally for same-sex marriage. Neither was Hillary Clinton. And now, you know, in, in, in the blink of an eye, we are branding people homophobes because they're not, they're not on board. Um, that's just so unrealistic and ridiculous, and I think some of the Trump voters saw that and they just felt very oppressed by a world in which if they don't think in what a certain camp of people have determined is the virtuous correct way and don't speak in the virtuous correct way. Which is constantly way, changing. Right, which has changed really quickly and, and you know, there's not much forgiveness. I think they felt a need to sort of rebel against that and Trump was, for some of them, the vessel of that rebellion. That's right. Wow. OK, I'm going to let, because the lights are blinding and the microphones are, are essential. So why don't we start over, start over here. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to know whether or not you two gentlemen believe that the, what you've described anecdotally and otherwise as the experience of the college student on campus today when it comes to free speech and First Amendment rights is something that the college student comes in with a predisposition to act that way, or is it a failure of progressive academia the same way that intersectionality kinds of arguments are? You mean, do is there a certain kind of freshman who comes in primed to behave this way, or is it that they learn it on campus? That they've already, that they, do you believe that they have already come into college with a predisposition to behave the way that you were rightfully critical of? Yeah. Or is it 
or is it a failure of progressive academia in having the kind of discussion that you're having today and teaching them that concepts such as, I like to use intersectionality as one of them because it has a particular meaning for me, but that that's not a legitimate concept. Um, they come with it baked in already, I think, because of the nature of social media. There's a certain kind of freshman who comes almost spoiling to behave this way. And it must be understood that in that person's mind, they're thinking, I wish to pursue justice and teach other students to do it. But they've learned that they need to do it in this shaming kind of a way. What that person has learned is that we have reached the end of intellectual history. The idea is that all of this talk about free speech is irrelevant because this hard leftist vision of the way things should be is truth that after 150,000 years of our species, we have finally found it. And the fact is that that vision has a lot to recommend it, but it's not the truth. We're really no closer to that truth than we were in 1950, 1850, or 1750. They don't know that because they've been taught otherwise. And there's a kind of professor. I'm not aware of any professor who teaches students to get out into the streets and to you know, try to assault Heather McDonald, et cetera. But there are professors who do teach this kind of social justice warrior ideology as, by not teaching anything else, truth. I've seen students come out of classes like that. They don't know. I don't hate the students. I completely understand what it must be like in their heads. But they need to be gently taught out of this new fashion. You want it on this side? Uh, I want to qualify one quick thing, which is uh, my college is awful on this issue. But I happen to live in Chicago, and the president of the University of Chicago, a very fine university, put out a policy piece on just this, where he talked about the fact that the University of Chicago would not coddle these people. It's my understanding that he thought other college presidents would follow suit. None, no. none, to my knowledge, did. Uh, but if you think that this, and I know the topic is about what goes on in college campuses, but if you think that's the only place, you're kidding yourself. We have a situation in Chicago now where a theater critic wrote a, a, a critical piece uh, of a play, and the racist thing she said was something to the effect that one of the characters uh, was a... Uh, well, he was a white policeman, but he was a, no, 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 but he, he it was a prototype of what, you know, that sort of person is. And uh, a group, a, a shadowy group has now gone out and is insisting that every um, theater, and we have about 200 theaters in Chicago, that every theater ban her from uh, coming in and reviewing. Now, they can't stop her from coming, but they said they would no longer give her tickets. So, um, this th and these are people who are post-graduates. This lady, this lady right here. Thank you very much. Um, what advice would you give to college students who are afraid to ask a question in a classroom because of potential negative repercussions? And I would also say this does not just uh, exist in colleges, it also exists in high school. Huh. Yeah. Do you want to take that one? <sighs> you know, I can't make students responsible for that. Talk about utopianism. Most people are not up for a fight. If most people were hardwired for that kind of battle, we couldn't have a society. And so I'm thinking of this ordinary college student who is thoroughly intelligent but doesn't want to have her head ripped off, who just keeps quiet. I can't tell her, speak up and have your head ripped off and get called a racist and buck up. I think that it's these students whose behavior needs, needs to change. Most people aren't up for being savage. Well, I mean, maybe, I mean, you tell me because you teach, but maybe, you know, we have professors who do and not, not quite to the extent that the media has portrayed it. We've exaggerated it somewhat. But we do have professors that get up and give, you know, those 
fabled trigger warnings. Um, why shouldn't professors, why shouldn't we now ask professors, because of what we're talking about today, to get up at the beginning of the semester of a class and make clear this classroom is a safe space for all kinds of opinions and discussions. There are no dumb questions. There are no forbidden ideologies, because we're all going to learn a whole lot more from that. And can we all agree that we're going to appreciate having that sort of discussion here and that no one's going to engage in any shaming? That might do some help. There are also things that some college presidents and administrators are exploring outside the classroom that I think are interesting to try to get students to interact in a more ideologically diverse way than they are. Um, so at, uh, David, at Davidson College, um, they, I think, have financial incentives for different student groups from different areas to actually hold social events together. At Denison College, they've actually uh, had discussions and explored ways to organize buildings and assign spaces on campus so that there's more physical interaction between people who might not otherwise have it. I think those are all very interesting things to explore that would send a strong signal that might create a world in a couple of years where that student isn't abashed about standing up and saying you know, something that all of her or his, his or her peers aren't immediately going to agree with. Thank you. Just a fast question. I've never heard of white privilege. I've never heard the term. And I'm and I, I, under the fact that we now had Mr. Obama, many people of color in Congress Shouldn't that whole concept be passe? Which concept? Of white privilege. Shouldn't it be just like your father's Oldsmobile? It's no. passed. No, I, I, I wish that it could be. But no, it's certainly true that if you are born white, you have a greater chance of success than if you are born black. It doesn't mean that being born black is a sentence to poverty and despair. It doesn't mean that there aren't, and this is a, now very much in the conversation, a great many white people who are suffering. But the whole white privilege idea, I mean, it used to be called societal racism or institutional racism. The term started to weaken, and so we now say white privilege because it grabs people more by the collar, so I'll use it. White privilege is real, yeah. But the issue is that it shouldn't be used as something to shut down conversation or to inculcate increasingly unreligious people with a new sense of original sin, which is what I think has happened. Uh, would both of you comment on the uh, rise of anti-Semitism on the campuses and how the pressure groups are trying to get the boards of trustees and directors to withdraw their financial support from anything that's related to Israel? That's nasty. Um, I've, some of the worst scenes I've seen in classes of my own and other classes have been students in battle over those issues and in general on Columbia's campus. In terms of what the prospect is of those calls for defunding, it seems to me unlikely. However, the fact that they've even been made and that social media magnifies these things is part of the environment that we're in. Teasing apart anti-Semitism from being against certain things that the country of Israel may or may not have done is a tough one. The battering ram is often that if you don't approve of Israel building settlements, you are somebody who hates Jewish people. That is an assumption that is often let pass in discussions of these issues on Columbia's campus. I've only seen it with young people. That's who I see. I haven't seen it with professors because I don't teach in those departments. But that's very much there. And I have watched people being torn apart to attempt to tease apart the difference between anti-Semitism and problems with the country of Israel. It's, it's nasty. Frank? Um, yeah, I agree with all of that. I think anti-Zionism has bled into an anti-Semitism, and people aren't conscious that they've, they've gone that extra step. Um, and I think it ties into this really unfortunate thing that happens today where there's a hierarchy of victim groups. You know? um, and Jews aren't, Jews aren't high up in that hierarchy anymore because Israel is the oppressor of Palestine. Um, they, are, they are oppressors and not victims, and that opens the gateway to anti-Semitism according to this kind of new intellectual construct. Would you agree with that? Definitely. That's the issue. Um, hi. My name is Beth Rieger, and I run an organization called Leadership Enterprise for a Diverse America. We work with talented low-income students from this country, and we help them get into top colleges and succeed there, recognizing, let's face it, these institutions are the gateway to the leadership sector. 
Um, with the growing national movement around expanding socioeconomic diversity on these campuses, I wonder what you see as the overlap between these new issues around safe spaces and the institution's fierce desires to bring more socioeconomic diversity to the campuses. I wonder if you see any coincidence or overlap or cause and effect there. And also recognizing what you said that many of these institutions have opened their doors to provide more diversity. But let's face it, the services and the structures in place on these campuses are really more geared towards the students that have been there since the inception of the institution. So we see many of our students very active in some of these issues. But then again, you know, I just wonder if these two trends overlap in any way in your minds. They do, but I have to say something that is um, a little bit white supremacist. <laughs> I feel that preferences and affirmative action should be maintained for a very long time, but that about 15 years ago, it was time to change the entire policy to be focused on socioeconomics, even though that would probably, on many campuses, let in more poor white people than brown. I think that if that became an official policy at selective schools, a lot of the conflict on campuses between people of different colors would just evaporate. Now maybe there would be open class conflict. Notice, however, that that sounds a little bit forced. There is progress, even if it happens slowly. I doubt that that would happen. And I think that it would be an affirmative action policy that almost everybody could get behind. And so, yes, the overlap is there. I think that if we had affirmative action based on lack of opportunity and disadvantage, and the overlap between that and being black was so large 50 years ago that that is the way it should have been done then, but things have changed. If it was just based on disadvantage, I think that we'd have much more harmonious campuses and nobody would be pretending to need to be safe from anything. My name is Jonathan Greenblatt. I'm the CEO of the Anti-Defamation League, or the ADL. So I wanted to follow up on the previous question and make a, different, make a separate point. So to the issue of anti-Semitism on college campuses and the blending of anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. Unless you oppose all forms of nationalism for all people, opposing self-determination for Jews is anti-Semitism, whether by intent or by consequence. And we see examples on college campuses across the country where pro-Israel or Israeli speakers are shouted down, are forced out of rooms, are not permitted to speak simply because of their nationality. And that's just wrong. Now on the other hand, I also want to make a point about this notion of white supremacy. And there was a comment made earlier about it. I think, although I'm saying we see a bit of radicalization on the left, and how Jews are perceived to be pro-Israel Jews are treated, make no mistake, white supremacy is a problem. And one of the things that we see happening are white supremacists, for the first time, actively recruiting at colleges and universities, trying to take advantage or exploit this backlash against political correctness. We've noted over 160 flyering incidences on 108 campuses during this school year. New groups we've never seen before are literally trying to exploit this moment right. and radicalize college students in a way that is very scary. So I, I just want to make the point that we shouldn't minimize it. It is indeed a real problem. Well, I, don't think, I, don't think, I don't think we're minimizing it. I think, I think you're absolutely correct. There is a thing called white supremacy out there, and there are white supremacists. The problem is when that term gets thrown around, as loosely as it does, it loses its sting when you need it most and when it actually defines what you're talking about. And the phrase white supremacist is at times being used for things much different from what you just described. In other words, we're not saying there's no white supremacy. We're saying that there is an issue of degree and extent that we need to think about. And that's sometimes difficult. But no, racism is real, white supremacy is real. There is evil, and it's not just in hidden places. Definitely. This is, we have room for only one last question. Let's go on back to this side. I'm just wondering, what do you think um, the, the, the stance of Republicans now has to do with how they are perceived on college campuses? When you think about how they stand on Planned Parenthood, or how they're coming out about Islamophobia, 
or climate change. Things that people in this age group, 18 to 22, feel very strongly about. Seems like the Republican position is not in alignment with. Frank, you want to take a crack at that? Um, well, I, I hate to speak of Republicans with a broad brush like that. Republicans are very diverse, as are Democrats. Um, I do think a sort of mutual enmity has been established, and there is a sort of kind of action and reaction, and people don't want to kind of cave to what they see as you know unreasonable demands, and they don't necessarily want to um, work in concert with people who have vilified and demonized them to an extent. And in that sense, I think there is the kind of relationship you're describing. But again, I don't think we can speak of Republicans as some unified bloc. I think a lot of people would feel differently about that and hold, hold different positions along the spectrum. The current platform of the Republican Party is uniquely difficult to defend on a college campus, and I don't think that's a partisan thing to say. I almost yearn for 15 years ago. Even under the, the, the George W. Bush administration, the issues were easier in a way. You could convince somebody that this is a different but entirely legitimate way of looking at things. That's harder with climate change. It's a tough time. But yes, to paint all Republicans with that broad brush is simply inaccurate. I often tell my students the, the trigger warning issue. I say, in my class, we are not going to assume that to be a Republican is to be an idiot. I also say to them, though, that I'm going to make fun of Trump and that that's not about Republicans, that's about him. And I say, if you don't like me making fun of him, too bad. But I always say, with Republicanism, you can be a perfectly sane person and be a Republican. You can be insane and be a Democrat. I want them to learn that. But justifying the case based on Republicanism exactly today, I find it very awkward. I, I doubt I'm alone in that. It's a tough period. I think one other thing you're getting at that I think is true is I think the Republican Academia is estrangement from Republicans or vice versa does make, I think, does contribute to the anti-intellectualism, the turn away from science in the Republican Party. I think that estrangement is braided into that. Thank you to both of you for all that you've